Welcome to Joy. So glad you're here. We can be here. We're healthy enough. We're free enough. We have a living God that deserves our worship. Uh, we are just so blessed. So totally blessed. <clears throat> Today I would like to uh, um, look at owning our choices from Matthew chapter number 14. Owning our choices. We see here on, a, uh, on the picture that I put up there, it says responsibility. And uh, I don't know if you can read the small white lettering, but if you all move to the front, you probably could. It says, no single drop of water thinks it's responsible for the flood. We all participate. Our actions have consequences. And regardless of how hard you or I try to blame someone else's choices as leaving us with no other choice, almost always, we have a choice in how we're going to respond. We need to own our choices. If there is any blame to be assigned, they're our choices. We should own up to it. You know, we love to point fingers. Our society loves to point fingers, but we do too. We love to blame other people rather than see the genuine need of others around us. And we need to choose to have compassion. Too many times we're pointing at other people and saying they are the problem, they have caused their own problems, they've caused problems for me, and they leave me no other choice but to do this. When in truth, as children of God, we should be able to look at people and we should be able to pray and see their genuine need. And from there, make a compassionate choice. You see, compassion always includes an action. Compassion demands an action on your part. If there is no action associated with it, it may be pity, it may be sympathy, but it's not really compassion. There is a difference. There must be a response that is generated to alleviate some of the problem, the difficulty, the pain, whatever it is that people are going through. And unless we take that extra step, we cannot consider ourselves compassionate. You need to change your thinking. You need to choose to change your thinking. And the choices you make if all of those things are going to lead you to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ, your Savior. By nature, we do not think like Jesus. By our societal upbringing, most of us do not think or act like Jesus. But as children of God, we have the Holy Spirit of God, we have the Word of God, and we have an obligation to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter number 14. That's what uh, Brother J.D. read this service for us. You know, these verses follow the beheading of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And it said at the beginning of that, when he heard that, that's when Jesus went away. Jesus was hurt by that too even knowing what was going to take place, it still hurt him. But here he is, going off, grieving in his own right. And it says, when Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray for transformation today. For anyone that might be here today without Jesus Christ as their Savior, 
May they come to know you today. May they choose to confess you and you alone as their Savior. For each of us who are already saved, Lord, we need to be more like you. This world needs the light of Jesus everywhere. Lord, transform us into that today. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. <clears throat> On the pathway of life, we all encounter a lot of different things. Scenarios, people, situations, health concerns. I mean, we're all going to face all kinds of difficulty. And as we go through, we need to understand a few certain things. First of all, that there are things that are going to come into your sight, into your field of vision, your area of influence, and uh, sometimes you can control those things, and sometimes you can't. But you always have a choice in how you'll respond. In those situations, we automatically have an emotional response to everything. It may be large, it may be small. It may be love, it may be hate. I mean, it could be anything in the realm of emotional possibilities. All right? Now, part of this, I will admit, is nature, if you will. It is your personality. It's who God made you. But much of it, most of it, in fact, is learned responses. And they can be trained and they can be controllable. And we all have been through this to some degree. All of you remember back when you were very small, especially, there were certain things that you were afraid of. Whatever that was, the dark, a bug, you know, anything. But as you grew up, as you became, came to understand what it was, you were able to change your response from that of terror and freezing or running or doing whatever it was to responding in what would be an appropriate way, right? You learned to change your emotional response based on what was really going on and what was, what was really important, how big the threat really was. So we have this response which can be trained, and then we have an action involved with it that is an act of the will. Now the act of the will, these actions that we take are absolutely Controllable. You decide whether you want to take a responsibility for it or not is another thing, but you decide what you're going to do, what you're going to say, how you're going to react. If you're going to do something about it, if you're going to hit somebody or hug them, okay? You know, you choose. And then come the consequences. Now, the problem with consequences is they are usually completely out of our control once we have acted. Which means we have to live with the consequences of them. Now, who among you has never said something and as soon as it left your mouth said, I wish I hadn't said that. You know? But you can't take it back. You may be forgiven for it, but you can't take it back. When we walk through life, we need to understand this. We need to see what needs to be seen. We need to turn away from what we shouldn't be looking at. We need to respond in a way that the Lord Jesus Christ would respond. Not the way the devil or some evil person would. Even our old self. Okay? Because we're all just sinners. It's who we are until we know Jesus. So we remain that person. The only difference is now we have an opportunity to be set free from those old responses, those old actions and reactions, and therefore change the consequences. 
of our actions. I like this Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. It says, Your actions speak so loud, I cannot hear what you say. You've been there. Somebody says they care, but they're tearing you down. You say, no, you don't care. Somebody says, I want to help, but they just leave you. Our Lord doesn't do that to us. We are to be patterning our life, our way through this life, based on what He would do and what He has done. I want to look at a, four examples from the Bible of situations <clears throat> where people made decisions that turned out to be pretty bad. The first one is Haman and Mordecai from Esther. You remember them? It says in Esther 5, But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation. What's that saying? It says, here's this man, Haman, who gets elevated to a higher position in the king's court, and as he's going through town, he expects everybody to either bow or stand up out of respect. He's the guy, all right? Mordecai, on the other hand, who is Esther's uncle, he doesn't do that. You know, the gate of the city was where business was transacted, so he must have been somebody that mattered in some degree. But when Haman and carried through or walks through or whatever it is, he looks over and Mordecai isn't standing out of respect. It says he is full of indignation. He had his pride wounded, and so now he is filled with rage. How much rage? He builds a gallows to kill him on. Okay? So here we have a situation. Here's Haman driving down the road, looks over. Mordecai won't give him the glory he thinks he deserves. And we have a biblical case of road rage. Not new. There's nothing new under the sun. All because his pride was wounded, he wanted to kill somebody. Sounds like the news, doesn't it? As God often does, it wasn't Mordecai that died on those gallows, it was Haman. For wounded pride. Another time, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And it says in Matthew 21, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that He, Jesus, did, and the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were sore displeased. Here's Jesus in town doing great things for their people and they're angry with Him. Because He was supplanting their authority. They were on top. Everyone should, everything should go through them. Right? These are the people who were trained up in the Scripture who should have recognized that this Jesus had fulfilled all of the Bible prophecies concerning the Messiah's birth and His life up to His ministry. But they were so concerned. The people were filled with hope. Okay? But they were so upset. They were sore displeased, which means they got really angry. Why? They thought they were losing power. And they think they can do something about that with God? 
Here's a people filled with hope that in a very short time, these people would go around, the, the priests and them, the Pharisees, they would go around and upset the people so badly that before long they're crying, crucify him. Their fear of losing power resulting in hope being washed away and a hopelessness setting in on the people of Jerusalem. They were against the very answer. They were setting up traps for Jesus because they wanted to have him, just like Haman, they were trying to get to be able to accuse him of a capital crime. Have him killed because he might take away some of their power. Well, he's God, people. He should. <laughs> David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 11, we have a situation where David, the king of Israel, it was the time of year when the battles took place. I mean, in that day and age, you had to plan everything, right? So it was the time when the king was supposed to be out on the battlefield and he was at home being lazy. I don't want to go fight. He goes up on the rooftop, it says. And it came to pass in the eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked up on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So he should have been somewhere else, and he was at home. He goes up on the roof, which is not uncommon, okay, in that day. And he looks over and sees a naked woman. And he should have, could have, very logically, had, an, had a way out of this. He should have turned around and walked away. I don't care if you're the king or not, right? No problems. He would have taken care of it. Instead, he stands there and lusts after her. Then he goes downstairs. Instead of repenting, what's he do? He says, who is she? Go get her for me. And in all of that, because of his lust, it would lead to adultery, it would lead to murder, and it would lead to the devastation of a number of families for generations to come. The consequences were way bigger than he thought. Couldn't have imagined it. Why? Because his head was all wrapped up in the lust, not in righteousness. Joseph's brothers, half-brothers, but still his brothers, he was, they were raised in the same family. They were moved with such jealousy in Genesis 37. It says, and when they saw him, Joseph Afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. You see a trend here? In the New Testament, it's written this way, the wages of sin is death. Sin leads to destruction, always. Here are these brothers who are blessed with many things, because of the family they're in. They get so jealous over their baby brother that they want to kill him. If one brother hadn't stepped in, he would have been dead. He goes off, he's sold into slavery, he's, he goes through, you know the stories. He is falsely accused, uh, and yet God uses him to save all of Egypt and his family raises him up to a position of power. Then years later, they come face to face with him. And they are still bearing the guilt of their decision. And now on top of that, here's the guy that if it had been them, they would be torturing and killing him. <laughs> okay, And they're standing there and he's the one with all the power. And they're terrified. You even see later on, 
a lot later when Jacob dies, the brothers are still filled with fear, thinking that, okay, since dad died now, he'll take out his revenge. But he didn't. Joseph is one of those types of Christ in the Scripture that just shows the amazing compassion, love, uh, endurance, faithfulness that Jesus had. They could have done a lot of things. They could have been happy for him. They could have went and talked to their dad. Maybe he'd have listened, maybe not, but they could have tried. They could have just kept on going. I don't know how much older they were than him, but you know we're talking about ten other brothers. That takes a little while, right? But instead, they conspire to kill him. Cruelty, lying, despair for their father. A lifetime of guilt and fear. We look at these four instances and we say, how much different would it have been if they had chosen compassion over judgment? Humility over pride. Scripture tells us, judge not that you be not judged. God says that judgment stuff, that's in my purview, not yours. Okay. And he said, you know this pride thing? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You ought to leave that alone too. Humble yourself and let me lead the way, is what he's saying. So we take this understanding from Scripture, the picture of Jesus seeing all these people. And what did he see? All these people had followed him out into the wilderness. And it's getting late, and here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is God. And all of his disciples, to a man, says, we need to send them home. It's way past supper time, and they need to eat. And Jesus said, they don't need to go anywhere. I'm here. What's our resources? And they go and talk to everybody, and they come back with five loaves and two fishes. And they say, can't be done. <laughs> What have I been teaching you, you know? And he has so much, they have to pick up baskets full after it's all over. Where God is, there is always an alternative for righteousness and for God to intervene and make a difference. We look at these and we understand that they happened. And we can look down on those people. We can you know, identify with them. We can do whatever. But if it doesn't change who we are, then it's not served its purpose. In these things, we can see who God is, but we can also see human, how humans are. So today, in your life, what impact should they have? That's the question. I mean, when you study Scripture... You're trying to figure out who God is, first of all. Just learn who God is, what He loves, what He hates, you know, what makes Him happy, if you can use that terminology, all right? And then you look, and if there's any application for you in it, you say, how can I incorporate this into my life so I don't see everything like I used to see it, so that I don't respond to everything like I used to respond to it, so that I don't make these stupid decisions and act in a way that's going to bring consequences that are negative for me or anyone else around me. What's our present society? And especially those things in particular that influence your life. What are they teaching you about personal responsibility? 
It's all messed up, isn't it? Today. Our theme for this year is grace and truth. You see it on the banner. You see it on the bulletin. You see it everywhere. Grace and truth. But our society is teaching anything but that. Teaching double standards everywhere. Now, in part, I understand. That world out there, it's ruled by the devil himself, the prince of the power of the air. Every heart that does not know Jesus Christ is, in fact, a child of the devil, according to Jesus himself. Okay? So when you look out there and you see double standards and you see hatred and you see rage and you see all of those things going on, people living lies and lying to you all the time, you say, I kind of expect that. After all, their father is the father of lies. But when you look in the mirror, if you are a child of God, if you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you see in that mirror? Jesus said, I'm going to my Father. I'm the light of the world. I need you to be the light of the world. And honestly, Jesus doesn't look anything like the devil. So what do we see? Have we allowed ourselves to be driven by society, by, I mean, you turn on the news today and there's probably not 5% of it. Truth. It's all opinion. And, and I'm not saying liberal or, or uh, conservative or anything. I, I'm all of it. It's all opinion. It's all from my perspective. It's all what will make me more powerful. All the things we saw in these Bible verses. There's one place for truth. That is in Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Jesus never lied. If I'm going to be conformed to the image of Christ, I'm not supposed to lie. Jesus loved everyone, even the people that were hating him. He forgave people that were nailing him to a cross. What do we see in the mirror? What do we hear in our own voice when problems come up? How much finger pointing are we doing? How much blaming are we doing instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm responsible for me. The way I think, the way my emotions are, that's on me. The choices I make, the words that come out of my mouth, those are all on me. As a matter of fact, when Jesus talks about judgment, He says, I want you to be so true to me that when I judge you, I'm going to judge you on your faithfulness. I'm going to judge you on your beliefs. I'm going to judge you on the standards you set for yourself. I'm even going to judge you for every idle word that comes out of your mouth in Matthew. Oh. All the finger pointing and blaming isn't going to work before Jesus. Who are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be like Him. That double standard is common. And we hate it out there. And then when we really come to understand who we are and what we're saying and what we're doing, we often have to admit, that's in me too. The world says I should be able to say anything I want. You should be okay with it but I can be offended about anything you say. Jesus said we're going to offend people if we speak truth. He said, don't worry. They're only hating you because they hate me and you're starting to look like me. <laughs> That's a good thing, okay? This world is so hypocritical. People always talk about that in the church. Oh, the church is full of hypocrites. 
So it's the rest of the world. Yeah? Shouldn't be in the church, but it's true. We have different standards for different people. I, I see that. But is it any wonder with what news and social media and the, the cultures of today are about that rage is everywhere, that hope is lost? The jealousy and lust drive so many decisions in so many people. What would you expect when that's what's being taught and that's what's being modeled? So we have to get our eyes off of that and back onto the Lord Jesus Christ. If we hope to bring hope to people's lives, to let them experience the love of God, we're going to have to be strong enough in our faith in Jesus Christ that when we are offended or injured and those things happen in our lives, that we, like Jesus, can say, forgive them, Father, but they know not what they do. That's the only way they're going to see it in this world because Jesus isn't here right now, right? Except in us. So critical. So important that we understand that. So how does taking that personal responsibility help you and others reset our priorities and find a godly balance and begin to treat others around us with the attributes of Christ instead of the attributes of a fallen human? As soon as we take accountability for it and we begin to hold ourselves accountable and it's best if we find somebody else to help hold us accountable. You know, how many of you have made resolutions in your life that you're going to change something, but you've kept it from people because you're afraid you might quit? I'm going to work out five times a week this year. First thing you need to do is go find a partner that's going to hold you accountable and say, call me. If I don't show up, keep calling me until I do. <laughs> you know? We don't like accountability. We like to be somebody else's, but we don't like it on us. But you know our behavior, the words that come out of our mouths, the attitudes that we display? We need to have some Christians around us close enough that are walking with the Lord to be able to recognize in each other and we won't be so offended when they say, hey, that wasn't very Christ-like the way you said that. The only way to redefine that baseline for our thoughts, our emotions, our actions is by trusting God so thoroughly that we know His way is always the right way. And then taking that Word of God and flushing out so much of that stuff that the world puts in there every day. Got to spend time in the Word. Got to spend time in the Word. Let God and God's Word set the standards and the control capacity because we have the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives us the power over sin, right? Let the Holy Spirit rule in your life. Obey when He says speak up. Obey when He says don't speak. <laughs> Obey when He says love them anyway. You know? We have to determine, we have to choose to take responsibility for our choices. We have to choose to own up to the decisions we make. It's not hard to own up to something when it's done right, is it? So we make it a lot easier on ourselves when we do it right in the first place. We need to own our choices. This Peter Shepherd wrote, healing comes from taking responsibility. To realize that it is you and no one else that creates your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. Now instead of being the victim, when you own up to it, you say, wait a minute, that was me. I can change me. I can't change them, but I can change me. 
I can begin to heal. I can begin to become more and more like Christ. After all, that's what the Bible says I'm predestinated to do if I'm a child of God, to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's time we own our choices. Be responsible for not only what we say and do to others, but even how we see them and their situations. To see when their countenance has fallen. To see when they're struggling in their life. We may not understand it. That's okay. But if God allows you to see it and gives you opportunity to make a difference, He's probably empowered you to make some kind of difference in that life. A lot of times, all people need is someone to come alongside and say, you're not alone. I'll be here with you through it. We need to walk by faith. We need to walk and talk like Jesus. Remember, he said, I'm the light of the world and I'm going to heaven. I need you to be the light of the world. And you can't do that living and acting like the devil. It's time we own up. It's time we take responsibility and say, whatever it takes, every single day, I want to be more like Christ. Every single day, if I bring in a bunch of pollution, I need to put the Word of God in there to get some of that out. Because I don't want my values to shift. I don't want my, my supply of grace and love from God to, to run short. Because there's people all around me that need to see Jesus today. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray. We pray, 